Test, test. <laughs> Good morning. For those of us joining, if you'd like to join the tables, we will be asking you to join up the front a bit later on. So if you would like to join now, you're very welcome to move ahead onto the tables. Good morning and welcome everyone here in the room or online to this roundtable and workshop on the implications of automated decision making on humanitarian futures. My name is Caitlin McCulloch and I'm the National Lead for Strate Strategic Operations and Projects at Australian Red Cross. I'll be your moderator this morning. I'm joined here by my colleagues from Humanitech who have put this session together and are around the room to help us, help us today. If they could wave so you can see them. Hi. Thank you, Humanitech team. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, as the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today. I would like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders of this continent and its adjacent lands, recognising their cultures as the oldest continuous living cultures in human history. I extend that respect and welcome to any First Nations participants who may be with us today in person or online. Australian Red Cross is Australia's largest humanitarian organisation. Sorry, just checking around the right slide there. Australian Red Cross is Australia's largest humanitarian organisation and a member of the world's largest humanitarian movement. We work in nearly 400 sites across Australia and our movement is present in 192 countries around the world. Our shared mission is to support people and communities in times of vulnerability caused by disasters, conflict or disadvantage. Digital transformation is an area of strategic importance for humanitarian and community services sectors. Our work is getting more complex and protracted and innovative use of data and technology, including ADM tools and systems, are helping us address humanitarian needs and empower communities. However, these tools and systems can create new forms of intrusion, insecurity and inequality, often at the expense of the most vulnerable people and communities. Given that the impact of ADM on society is expected to grow significantly in the coming decades, we need to work collaboratively across sectors and disciplines to understand and address the risks and make the most of the opportunities. To this end, in 2018, Australian Red Cross established Humanitech as a strategic initiative to explore the opportunities and challenges at the intersection of technology and humanity in collaboration with academia, private sector and other humanitarian and community organisations, including as an industry partner in the ADMS Centre. As part of this collective exploration, today we are bringing together humanitarian and community sector practitioners with the ADMS Centre research community to canvas emerging issues and insights at the intersection of automated decision-making and humanitarian action and identify opportunities for collaboration. Now to our wonderful panel. I'm excited to introduce our excellent lineup. As you might expect, due to illness, we've lost a couple but have some excellent replacements who have joined us with very little notice. Thank you so much for doing that. I'll keep this brief. As most of our panellists, you can find their bios and contacts on the symposium program. Joining us, we have Professor Sarah Pink, who is the Director of Emerging Technologies Research Lab at Monash University. Sarah is an expert in automation and digital and emerging technologies and is known globally for her leadership in futures and design anthropology. Welcome, Sarah. Professor Anthony McCosker is a Deputy Director of the Social Innovation Research Institute at Swinburne University. He researches the impact and use of social media and new communication technologies with a focus on digital inclusion, participation and data literacy. Hi, Anthony. Hi. Rahul Sones, sitting next to me, is the co-founder of the Disruptive Business Network. He is an engineer with a master's in international business and formerly managed the Trust Alliance, a multi-sector collaboration on how technology can be committed to humanity. Sunushka Mudlier, who is joining us via Zoom, is director of the Red Cross Red Present Global Migration Lab. 
She previously worked in program management and policy roles for international NGOs and academic think tanks and as a specialist consultant to the ILO, IOM and UN Women, focusing on human rights and humanitarian protections for, mi for migrant workers. And finally, I'm delighted to introduce Mark Andrea Vick, who is a professor of media studies at Monash University. His research covers the social, political and cultural impact of digital media with a focus on surveillance and popular culture. Thank you so much, all of our panelists, for joining today. OK, before I give them the mic, uh, a little bit more for me, uh, a quick overview of the session today. Sorry. Today's session will start with a panel drawing on their expertise to illuminate some of the opportunities and challenges of ADM for humanitarian and community work. Followed by small table discussions with all of you, our panelists and our Humanitech team to explore your experiences, examples, hopes, ideas and concerns. The session will conclude with panelists sharing back key highlights from those discussions. The Humanitech team will be documenting key themes, topics and questions from the day and share this with the audience after the event with the intent of sparking future collaborations. A reminder for those in the room, this session is being recorded. And for those of you who have joined online, welcome. We have Humanitech team member Julia Goodall joining from South Australia, and she'll be in the chat to help with any questions. OK, let's get our panel discussion started. And I'll start with Professor Sarah Pink. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about something which I've been thinking a lot about recently, so it's potentially not one of the things that I would usually be speaking about, but one of a research topic and an issue that I think is super important. So what I'm going to talk about is related to safety. We spend a lot of time, I think, in, when we think about automation and ADM, we start, spend a lot of time thinking about keeping ourselves or keeping people safe from automation. There's so much narrative about that. But I want to think a lot more about how automation can help people to keep people safe. Now, I'm going to start by just saying something about asbestos, which obviously is something we do need to be kept safe from still. In case people don't know, it's a group of, it's, um, a group of six naturally occurring silicate minerals made up of thin microscopic fibers. It offers heat and chemical resistance, fireproofing and strength. As a result, it was a popular additive to a variety of products. And this is all from the mesothelioma website. Individuals exposed to asbestos face health risks, including cancer and other illnesses. Particularly, of course, asbestos causes mesothelioma, a very painful way to die, because the tumours that it causes to grow in the lungs put pressure on the nerves. So it's really something that nobody particularly wants to have. The mesothelioma website also notes that um, asbestos was mined predominantly in the US, although also in some other places. Now, asbestos has been banned in Australia since December 2003. And importing or exporting asbestos or goods containing asbestos is prohibited under Australian law, except in very limited circumstances. Although in 2017, it was still used in some countries around the world. And in 2022, the EPA and the USA we're still seeking to ban it completely in the United States. But of course, although asbestos is banned, it's still present in our lives in many ways, particularly in our buildings. It was used in many household items, including ceiling and flooring tiles. Generally, it was used in anything related to insulation, cement flooring, roofing, and fireproof products. It was used in ironing boards, chimneys, all those kinds of things. Now, part of my work about automation in the construction industry has started to focus on the possibilities of automated systems and technologies for asbestos detection and removal. Now, that's particularly relevant, for example, for asbestos testing and detection on website, on, on construction sites, and also in the demolition sector, of course, where workers could become exposed to asbestos firsthand. A participant in my research has discussed how often workers don't have the right protective clothing and um, equipment when they test and detect asbestos. But often it might not be detected at 
at all exposing workers to asbestos fibers. Now, for the, for the humanitarian sector, which is the reason why I'm talking about this today, there's a set of related challenges which were identified at a 2020 Humanitarian Networks and Partnership Week in Geneva. And I'll quote these, some of these, not all of them, but they included, firstly, a lack of awareness of risks posed by asbestos in the humanitarian sector, whereby uh, urban search and research teams, rescue teams, may be exposed to asbestos while working in buildings, and in some situations may not be properly protected. It's also unclear if the standard insurance packages for humanitarian, expat and national staff actually covers asbestos-related illnesses. There are questions of how and whether governments communicate risk information on asbestos, particularly in countries where it's not banned. There might be weak regulations in handling and disposal of asbestos. There are some countries where vested commercial interests in mining minerals actually mean that it's not um, promoted so much as an issue. Also, of course, severely damaged buildings can pose significant challenges. An example was given of how damaged buildings being blown up because they were difficult to deconstruct might lead to explosions actually spreading asbestos-containing dust. It can also be hard to confirm the presence of asbestos in burned buildings. So in the humanitarian sector then, asbestos is still raising challenges, in some ways similar to the construction industry. But what kind of tech research then is being carried out to confront these issues and where can automation help? Well, these environments, construction sites, disaster sites, of course, are very difficult to design robotic technologies for. Robots can find it difficult to navigate unpredictable terrains and conditions. A recent EU-funded project sought to design robotic tech for asbestos removal in the construction industry. But the researchers concluded that, they said, a service provider or a startup company would not be able to afford the investment to put in place a working and validated system in asbestos removal. They also pointed out that a direct move to the asbestos removal market was considered unrealistic for robotic tech because most relevant functions are implemented and integrated, but an operation validation of the fully integrated system cannot be taken over by an end user at the moment. So, the tech that's been looked at, but I've only found one project that was actually developing this tech, which was this one, which had failed. Um, in the meantime, in Australia, actually a startup has developed a robotic tech called Marvin, which uses AI to analyze images of asbestos fibers. So, there is some work in this area, but the, one of the issues is that the interested investors in tech for the construction industry my research participants have suggested that really for robotic tech to be a worthwhile investment for the industry, it needs to have the right appeal, it needs to have universal uses, um, it needs to save a lot of money. It's mostly being developed for off-site construction, which of course, off-site fabrication for construction. Of course, there are claims that that makes the construction industry safer. But on the ground, people say that their needs are different. For small and medium enterprises and what my participants called mum and dad companies, they actually can't afford robotic tech. is isn't produced cheaply, it's not accessible. Even if tech to detect and remove asbestos was available, who would be able to afford it? In fact, the one project, the EU project I found, um, as I said, it really, it not only said that, you know, it's so-called what they call end users, um, wouldn't be able to engage with it. It also completely neglected to engage with the social sciences or any kind of organization or group or research that would even help it to engage with end users. So it was completely separated from the real people who would use such technology. So what's my point here? Just to summarize, there are some things that ADM could really help with, like making um, work in the construction industry, where workers are very vulnerable already, making work and humanitarian work in disaster sites safer. So what's our role as researchers? How can we actually think strategically across these issues? How can we go beyond the critique that we need to be kept safe from ADM and the power relationships that constitute it to actually think about how ADM can really constructively be used to keep people safe 
in industries where you have a lot of vulnerable workers, but also in humanitarian work where people could be exposed to dangerous materials unknowingly. So that's the kind of thing I'd like us to think about. How can we work towards those real tangible inc outcomes that mean that ADM keep people safe and keep people alive for longer? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Next up is Professor Anthony McCosker. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Um, I'll try to be brief and just to spark some thinking um, at the tables before we get into the work part. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some projects that I've been really fortunate to, to be involved in with Red Cross over the last few years, five or six years or so. Um, and I'm actually we're thinking a lot about that, that exact point of um, end users of technology and, and how um, you know, the technology is produced that um, you know, they're, they're using incredibly sophisticated um, mapping technology and, and modeling technology and predictive technology, for example, actually can filter through to communities and people who need them in humanitarian um, situations, so in terms of disaster and, and um, crisis and, and emergency. Um, so some of the early work that we were doing kind of kicked off around um, questions that um, Red Cross were raising at the time in, in, in the sense of what, um, what the idea of uh, everyday humanitarian action actually is um, for people in their local um, circumstances and in their local communities. And I'm using the term community, but it, I, I understand it's very complex and contested term, um, but I'm thinking about this, you know, whether it's, well, most particularly about the local environments that we're part of and that connection with environment. And this is not just about, you know, rural, regional areas that are affected by um, floods and, and fire and heat and storm and so on, um, but also our local, local neighbourhoods. Um, we saw the importance of those local neighbourhoods in situations like um, pandemic lockdowns. Um, so we were looking at mapping um, everyday humanitarian action to, um, through, through sources like th sources of local knowledge like, um, like Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter and so on to get a sense of what humanitarian action looks like for people um, outside of the humanitarian organisations and networks and, and volunteers. What are they doing in their own everyday life? Um, and took that work then into the response to um, the, the um, black summer bushfires in Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, and we did some rapid mapping of the, the, the circumstances around which local people and groups were mobilizing themselves through their own mechanisms, networks, and the, the technologies that they had to hand. Um, and I think this is something that's carried through to um, recent experiences in Lismore, for example, where we saw amazing examples of that use of low tech before the high tech comes in and before the support and agencies arrive um, that can be as simple as um, using shared spreadsheets, Google, Google spreadsheets that are open and public to coordinate activity when it was really needed. Um, so that, that relationship between, you know, the big sort of automated um, systems that are built, that are that are um, engineered and tested and the, the kind of data inputs that, that go into them, um, the incredible you know, advances around machine learning, the connection and relationship between that and people on the ground and in situations that, that need um, to access and use that technology or need to, to act in some ways, I think really interesting for us to think about. In our current work with um, Red Cross through the ADMS Centre, um, we're really trying to hone in on that community um, response and, and community empowerment, um, or what we're, we're referring to as community resilience um, aspect of, um, of preparedness. Um, so it's, it's all of the work that a community, a local community, can do before disaster happens. And we heard earlier this week at the Humanitech panel um, that you know, we know that so much resources go into the disaster and the response, um, the situation and the response, and um, the attention fades after that point. And we know that there's a huge um, long tail in terms of recovery process 
uh, that often goes unnoticed and, and unknown, and we can see that still taking place in Lismore and elsewhere um, now. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of work that ordinary people in communities do in preparedness in the lead up to um, you know, potential um, disaster events and, and emergencies. So um, just, to, just to frame that a little bit, the IFRC, um, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, defines um, community resilience as the ability of communities and their members um, exposed to disasters, crisis, um, and underlying vulnerabilities to anticipate, pre prepare for, reduce the impact of, um, and cope with and recover from the effects of shocks and stresses without compromising their long-term prospects. So this is just really about, um, you know, building the, the kind of community connections and resources that are needed before um, an event, and then those that can be mobilized during and after. Um, so our project is actually about mapping community resources and trying to build the tools that you know, might be able to be taken to and tested with and co-developed with communities themselves to map, um, to map what we're calling community resources or in, in community development sectors um, is sometimes referred to as assets and asset mapping. And this is usually done manually and it's, it's often about people, um, uh, groups uh, in their local environment who know people, um, who you know, make the connections, who understand um, the, the lay of the land, that have the local knowledge. Um, so what we're looking at is ways that we can um, build new kinds of data. And this is where um, we have to be careful about you know, overreaching and overstepping in terms of the, the issues that we know and the, the problems that we know in terms of um, the, the harms that can be carried with more data. Um, but we also know that from all of the reviews and, and um, uh, assessments of the disaster scenarios that we've had over the last decade, we know that data gaps, information gaps, local knowledge um, or lack of local knowledge is one of the key issues. Um, so we're looking at trying to, trying to work out what are those um, useful resources that, that can be mapped, that can be, that can be identified, um, and then how can we surface those and, and bring them into, say, you know, um, an open mapping um, platform, or perhaps that's not the right way of doing it, but it's actually about um, ensuring that there are people within local community areas that, that can mobilise that information. And what we're, what we're looking at or what we're referring to here in terms of local resource data um, is uh, things to do with people, groups, serv groups services, infrastructure, um, and local knowledge. And, and that's quite all-encompassing. There's a lot of stuff in that. But um, important for us to then start to break down and for us to be able to bring to light. Um, there's a whole heap of additional steps that we can look at in terms of automation, but I think the first step for me is about capability and awareness and, and building the, the kind of platform for doing that kind of work in, in communities. I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much, Anthony. I've always enjoyed the collaborations between Red Cross and uh, Swinburne over the last few years. Fantastic to hear. Sharing next is Rahul. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, firstly, I should say that I feel like a bit of a fraud being up here because we've got the OG of the Trust Alliance in Katie Southall, the original backer of the Trust Alliance in Penny Harrison, and also Professor Ellie Rennie, who was the, on the original steering committee, all in the audience. I'm not sure what I'm doing up here, but uh, let's plow ahead. Um, so the Trust Alliance was launched in 2019 by the Australian Red Cross. And the Trust Alliance is a multi-sector collaboration that was set up to really look at uh, the emergence of a useful and ethical uh, digital identity framework. And the goal was really uh, equal, uh, equal and uh, access to digital identity for all. 
so the, when it was set up, the, the Trust Alliance really looked at this from you know, a, a poly, policy perspective, an advocacy perspective, uh, from research, uh, but also how can we build you know, technology that helps solve this problem. Uh, now, digital identity is such a huge meta problem, and you know there could be a million solutions. So, the uh, the uh, I suppose the sliver that we focused on was digital credentials, and that how can uh, members of the trust alliance uh, kind of trust each other enough to share credentials? Um, and so. To do that, we looked at this technology called verifiable credentials, which, very short, is, is a way that uh, the holder of the credential is in charge of their data, and then they, they can choose what data they, they, can, uh, they need to share. Um, so the, we ran a couple of experiments, and the first experiment was with uh, Traverse, who was a, a, a I suppose a digital skunk works that was backed by the Red Cross, and we built a digital wallet. We installed a verified credential into the wallet, but uh, when it came to rolling it out, uh, the take-up was um, zero, to be honest. Uh, so, so then we looked at, okay, what are the human barriers to adopting this technology? Uh, and can we set up an experiment that really focuses on those human barriers? So what we did with the next credential was we asked for four volunteer organizations. We asked them to each put up five volunteers. And the experiment was that, um, say, the volunteers from the Australian Red Cross would do their training at Care Australia and then go back, at the Australian, go back to work at the Australian Red Cross. And the same with Oxfam and Save the Children. And even there, you know, when it when we set up the experiment, everyone agreed it was a good idea. But then when the rubber hit the, the road, the organizations balked. And the reasons were things like uh, internal processes, audit requirements, HR processes, legal, you know, legal uh, processes. So then we really had to go back to the drawing board and, and think about, you know, it's, it's in our name, but what is trust? And how do we get organizations to really trust each other? Can we really build a community so that um, rather than you know, we build technology for the community, we build technology with the community? So then the, and then the strategy kind of shifted from a go-to-market to a go-to-community where, where rather, than, uh, uh, you know, rather than products are sold, you know, products are adopted, rather than creating, uh, rather than capturing value, we create value. And um, rather than, you know, how many leads are optimized, we really need to ask ourselves, you know, how many people did we, did we help? And that's where we're at right now. Thank you so much. I'm still proud of that credential that was on my phone, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. If we can uh, pop the Zoom up now. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us online today, Sanushka. Go ahead. We've got an issue with sound at the moment. Do you want to try again? How's this? Oh, there you are. Excellent. Go ahead. Brilliant. Um, I thank you for having me and I want to apologize on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Arias Kubis, who has been uh, struck down by the flu. Um, it's very interesting listening to the presentations today uh, and reflecting on my work. To provide you with a bit of background, uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, has created a global migration lab as an action research institute to support our organizations who provide humanitarian assistance and protection to migrants in situations of vulnerability in over 100 countries with the ability to transform the data and operational insights as well as the technical knowledge that we are uh, able to collect from the field into evidence-based research so we, we 
have been created recently to try and facilitate the creation of this sorts of research based on the experiences on the ground and also to use that to inform operations and to advocate for humane migration policies and practices. So in thinking about the topic and how it relates to my work, uh, And in particular, I was asked to reflect on digital waters surveillance and digital rights of vulnerable migrants as they search for safety. I think it's very clear that technology obviously plays a central role in the creation of our borders today and that these digital tools are being used to exclude migrants and to control migrants who manage and enter countries and regions. And the humanitarian implications of these uses of technology, I think are quite clear in the way that they range from increasingly frequent humanitarian concerns that actually arise at the physical location of borders. So we see detention of individuals uh, on the basis of the use of uh, facial recognition technology or um, various programs which are designed to identify um, people who are planning to violate visa concern, visa um, conditions, as well as uh, we see situations such as um, at the end of last year on the border of Belarus and Poland, there were thousands of migrants who were stranded in freezing conditions related to the particular politics of the location at the time. But surveillance technologies were also being used to identify and locate individuals and we also see the same thing happening in the Americas, um, where technology is being used to, tra to track groups of migrants as they travel overland. I'm sure many of you will remember the media around that a couple of years ago. Uh, at the same time, it's also really clear that these tools have the potential to enhance the provision of humanitarian services and assistance to vulnerable migrants on the move. Red Cross, Red Crescent organisations globally run what we call humanitarian service points, which are places of safety at which migrants are welcomed and provided with access to essential services along major migration pathways. So the idea is that these, these points exist and migrants know they can go towards them um, in the event of humanitarian, uh, to, to, to uh, fulfil their humanitarian needs. Identifying where and when to equip these service points in response to changing local conditions is one of the challenges. And another is that these are operated by different Red Cross and Red Crescent national societies. So we, we internally have need to create cross-border systems to enhance our coordination and ensure the perfective provision of, uh, provision of services and to facilitate logistical planning and coordination. But all of this occurs in the context of extremely uh, and increasingly hostile national migration laws and policies. And so when we, when I think about the presentation uh, that Anthony just pr um, provided around the use of technology to think through uh, disaster preparedness and resilience in communities, it in, in my area of work, it's, those kinds of um, very important and useful forward planning also become replete with knotty issues around how host communities and displaced or migrant populations relate to each other and what the implications of say forward awareness around population displacement movements might be in terms of national security planning around migration and borders. And this is, I think, this relates back to the broader issue that we grapple with in migration, humanitarian migration issues around the, the fact that post-war refugee conventions and systems actually don't adequately protect or address in the context of the 21st century concerns that we are grappling with. Now, this is something that is um, a subject of academic study. There's a lot of practitioners working on this problem, but really the old systems don't really work in the context of the factors that are leading to humanitarian need of vulnerable migrants. And of course, humanitarian organisations are providing assistance and protection in highly politicised spaces. So our access to vulnerable migrants is tightly controlled and regulated by governments. 
And uh, we, we see increasingly that migrants are required to provide significant amounts of personal information and data at different stages of their journeys. And governments are sometimes requiring organisations to collect this data. So I just want to give one example um, that was documented in a 2021 Human Rights Watch report. It involved Rohingya refugees in the camps in Bangladesh who were told that they needed to register as refugees to access services. However, they didn't get a chance as part of that registration to opt out of a government-backed digital identity smart card. The data collected in those cards, including biometric scans, was then shared with the Myanmar government, often against refugee wishes and in circumstances that were, are under investigation, and resulted in a situation where these migrants would potentially be subject to forced repatriation or retribution if they ever return to Myanmar. So it's because of situations like such as this that we need to really think carefully about what data we're collecting and what what uses it may be put to. Uh, and Oxfam has provided a, a best practice example of how to address this in that they had a blanket moratorium on the use of any biometrics in their work until 2021 and then they implemented a biometric and foundational identity policy that establishes best practice clear red lines about the collection and use of information. Of course when we think about how these kinds of policies are used in practice and how we store data, what that data may be used for if fallen into the wrong hands and you know, this also occurs in the context in which we have increasingly sophisticated hacking attempts that are targeting humanitarian organisations. And it's not clear what the purpose, who, who, is, who is implementing those attacks and what their purpose is. We need to be careful in thinking through, even if we have these policies in place, when organisations such as ours, such as Oxfam, are, are thinking about collecting this data. So one final point related to that is that the passing of biometric data to governments in Myanmar is linked to growing evidence and concern that migrants along the world's most dangerous migration routes may be intentionally avoiding seeking life-saving assistance and support because of this risk of detention and removal. Um, we there, There's increasing anecdotal evidence that migrants uh, may, that the potential use of technology may be inadvertently causing distrust within the refugee community and disrupting asylum processes. And the lab is currently exploring this issue um, through a project that collects interview and survey data from vulnerable migrants in 15 countries. As part of this project, even though we're not collecting any personally identifiable data, we're really grappling with questions about what information it's appropriate and ethical to collect and how we can fully inform migrants of their data rights and obtain informed consent. Per personally, I feel very cautious about harnessing the technologies at our disposal to improve the delivery of humanitarian services. If there's any risk that migration status or even citizenship of individuals and groups may be identifiable as a consequence, and I'm keen to learn from you all and think about whether the benefits of harnessing these technologies can be realised in the context of humanitarian needs related to restrictive national migration laws and policies. So when we overlay the existing concerns with the migration, um, the, the context of migration politics today. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sanushka. So exciting to have the global migration lag getting established over the last two years, so you're able to explore these projects. Thank you. Up next is Mark Andreevic. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I work in the area of uh, digital surveillance and digital media, and I'm gonna pick up on some of the themes in this previous presentation uh, around the collection of biometric data. Specifically, I've been doing work on facial recognition technology, a quite contested and vexed um, the technology in a variety of contexts. And one of the things that we were interested in doing was examining what some of the potential uh, positive pro-social humanitarian uses of the technology might be. Um, but as the previous presentation suggests, uh, it's always quite contested terrain when you start talking about the collection of biometric data, uh, the conditions of consent, uh, the possibility of hacking, uh, and what might happen to this data. But I'm gonna talk through a few use cases that we've come across in the work on face recognition to think about some of the potential humanitarian uses. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll start with um, identification for people who have lost uh, their identification papers. So in the 2019-2020 bushfires uh, here in Australia, um, a number of people uh, had to flee their homes so rapidly that their credentials were destroyed uh, and they were left without the ability to prove their identity. Australia, however, had simultaneously been creating a national face recognition database. Uh, you may, some of you may be familiar with um, what's happened with that database. Basically, the states have uh, used the reference images that they have at their disposal, driver's license, other forms of state ID, passports, folded that into a, nation, a national face recognition database. However, that database, the enabling legislation for the use of that database has been stalled around concerns about uh, how the uh, database will be used, especially for policing purposes. But in the wake of the bushfires, uh, they were able to provide an exception to access that database in order to be able to verify the identity of people who had lost their identification papers and um, <clears throat> provide them with new identification papers and also verify their credentials for receiving aid uh, in the wake of uh, the disaster that they suffered. Um, so uh, that's, you know, behind that I think is a deeper push uh, which is going to be important to interrogate uh, behind collapsing what we might think of as possession as a form of verification into identity as a form of verification, right? Instead of, you know, I have these papers, these prove who I am, collapsing the papers into bodies is one of the moves that's happening in biometrics, right? You don't need your passport if you can have some form of biometric verification that's attached to your credentials. So it's not about having those credentials, it's about being uh, that identity. Uh, and of course that raises a host of concerns around um, what happens if that identity is hacked, um, what happens if there's an error? What type of right of appeal do you have? What's your default verification to say, this is who I really am? Um, the, uh, so I, in each of these cases, I think you'll see perhaps potential benefits, but also potential concerns. And I, I suppose that's uh, um, maybe a useful uh, area for discussion. The, the second use case I'll say a little bit about is the identification uh, uh, of uh, victims, uh, sorry, of people separated by war, disaster, and migration. The Red Cross has a trace the face program that's a, a kind of manual program. Um, people who have been separated f for various circumstances and want to find family members, they can post uh, a photo of themselves to trace the face. Uh, and then that, those trace the face images are made available through a website and also through Red Cross checkpoints. So if you're looking for a family member, you can go and see if that family member has posted an image of themselves to trace the face. Um, or you can also put an image of yourself in anticipation of that family member coming to that site and looking to see, uh, to you know, reconnect with you. Um, there is potential there, uh, and I've had some discussion uh, with the folks working on Trace to Face about what, the, what it might mean to think about uh, using automated systems to help facilitate that process. Right, right now it relies on a kind of pull model. Somebody has to go, um, uh, A, you know, post their image, but then somebody on the other side has to go and, and look for it and see that it's there. There is the possibility of using automated systems. Um, for example, if you have a reference image of somebody that you're looking for, you could supply that refer reference image, uh, and then that could be entered into the database. An automated system could try to find a match to see if that person has posted um, that image. It raises some uh, interesting host of questions, but also questions about what happens when um, uh, there's an extended period of time between a reference image uh, and a posted identification image. You may have seen uh, a case that got some publicity a while back in China of a man who um, was kidnapped uh, and sold to another family as a child. Uh, 32 years later, using face recognition technology uh, that also 
aged, took the reference image of the child uh, and aged it, was able to match this individual with their family and there was a reunion after 32 years. That seems like quite an astonishing feat to age an image 32 years. But of course, that's something that folks who are working on the technology have been spending some time with, thinking about how it is that you can um, capture <coughs> changes that take place over time. Uh, and that gets to my third use case, which is uh, a bit more of a morbid use case, uh, but has to do with identifying victims of war and disaster. Uh, here, of course, the issue is also uh, changes in physical characteristics over time that have to do with uh, damage, injury, decomposition. Uh, and there are folks who we've been talking to who are engaged in the process of trying to imagine how it might be possible to take reference images of living people and uh, use those to match with um, uh, the victims of war or disaster. Uh, folks who have deceased people who are in various stages of decomposition. How can you figure out how to take a system and uh, um, simulate the types of changes that take place? Uh, and so there are, there are data sets uh, that match identification images of people with subsequent images of um, deceased bodies. Uh, in various stages of decomposition, trying to develop systems to create a, an automated match. Um, there is even a project afoot uh, to supplement visual images uh, that are you know, photographically generated with CT scans and even DNA information to be able to reconstruct a face based on uh, in cases where you don't, uh, where decomposition has reached the level where you don't have a face anymore to match, but you are working with basically bones. Um, so that's a quite a speculative project, but you can imagine uh, uh, the potential uses of that, identifying victims in mass graves, um, trying to uh, repatriate remains or uh, get remains to families. Um, so those are some use cases, some maybe a little bit more speculative than others. Uh, in terms of the issues that are raised as, as we are around some of these, um, in terms of the provision of biometric information for identification, um, you know, in some cases, obviously consent is, is a huge issue. Um, when that information is being provided, what conditions is it being provided under? Um, so when you, there are folks who are in, uh, uh, you know, maybe migrants who are um, being asked, almost compelled to provide their biometric information, uh, to what extent is that, can that be considered consent and what alternatives might be available? Um, data security for these databases is a big issue. Uh, if your biometric identity is hacked, Remedying that is different from hacking other forms of documentation. Uh, it can be quite tricky. Um, there are also concerns around the inferential uses of biometric information when conclusions are drawn from biometrics about other characteristics beyond identification. There are also issues of um, when it comes to things like facial recognition, which is a passive at a distance form of recognition. Uh, that if access is available to databases, if they've been hacked or if they're being um, used, for example, by law enforcement, the ability to uh, identify people at a distance without their consent. So uh, you may be familiar with Clearview AI, the app to, um, developed by an Australian citizen uh, in a US-based company. There are folks in the US who wanted to create databases of undocumented immigrants, enter them into Clearview AI, and then make it possible to engage in remote forms of uh, identity verification without people's knowledge. So basically, go around um, wherever, if you're uh, suspicious that somebody might be undocumented, capture that image, match it to the database. So to create a kind of border everywhere by the use of of this technology. Um, 
the, uh, the, the issue of appealing or verifying the machine's findings. Obviously, um, you know, what uh, forms of contestation are available if one has been identified or if one has been misidentified? What forms of appeal uh, are available? When it comes to identification of bodies, uh, the ability to actually verify the accuracy of the types of speculative systems that are at work. Um, I, su I suppose I should say when it comes to disaster uh, identification of victims, the potential benefit of this type of technology, um, at least from the folks that we've been talking to, is um, uh, A, verification. Sometimes it can be hard for families to identify bodies that um, are in various stages of decomposition. And if a mistake is made, that's a double mistake, right? People have wrongly identified perhaps a family member, and that person is, is now wrongly identified for people who might be looking for that family member. It can be very time consuming to use other forms of identification, uh, uh, such as DNA, dental records, um, requires form of expertise that are costly and time consuming. The face recognition is uh, proposed as one uh, potential um, uh, more rapid form of uh, identification. Um, and uh, the, the issue of, um, of enrollment. Face, face recognition uh, lends itself to particular uses because those reference images are often available. But for other forms of identification, like iris, fingerprint, DNA, that requires collecting that information first. And so the conditions uh, of collection of that information uh, are important to take a look at. So those are some potential uses of face recognition that we've been looking at, and I think they have some wider implications for questions about biometric forms of identification. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mark. A fascinating exploration of the opportunities and challenges across those use cases. I'm actually taking a joint role today. I'm a moderator, but I'm also a panelist, so it's my turn now. Um, I've worked across the community services sector over the last 12 years, including various roles across different Red Cross programs and sectors. At the moment, I'm coordinating our nationwide social inclusion and well-being aged care programs. And of course, aged care is a sector which is in the midst of, in the midst of sig significant reform and digital transformation itself. I want to highlight some challenges, opportunities and stories from our work in aged care and from another area Red Cross works in, supporting people who have had contact with the justice system. As those of you who also work in the community sector would know, we often find ourselves at the coalface working with individuals and communities who are the most impacted by the rapid transformation of technology, seeing their everyday challenges and both their and our as providers limited resources to embrace the opportunities. As providers of services, we're required to adapt to the transformation and support communities to adapt, often filling a gap between an impl implemented technology that our clients need to use to access services without any support and education to use them. But there are of course significant opportunities when we do have the resources and it's amazing to see some of the life-changing outcomes, for example, when we work with people to build their digital skills and what that opens up for them. The changes in technology in Australian social service provision over the last decade are now largely unremarkable and just part of day-to-day -day life. MyGov is used by most adults living and working in Australia, My Aged Care for aged care consumers, and My Place for NDIS consumers. And while these supportive technologies, MyGov, My Health Record, My Aged Care, My Place, are not strictly forms of ADM, they do function as a precursor to ADM by providing the te technological and operational infrastructure that later supports automation. Of course, I had to have a laugh when I put this together because I had never connected the My Government branding across all those platforms despite using them on a weekly basis. Um, of course, for a lot of people, it can sometimes be my complicated service at the end of the day. Of course, the most well-publicised example that most of you will already be aware of, um, of the risks involved when a supportive technology has utilised ADM to reduce or replace a function previously performed by a human is the Centrelink RoboDebt scandal. And for many of us, these platforms make our lives easier, but for people who already face barriers to using technology, whether it's infrastructure costs, digital literacy, language barriers, physical or cognitive disability or remote location, the more they are imp implemented without accessibility considerations and support to overcome the barriers, further marginalisation of the order already marginalised continues. At Red Cross, when it comes to people we work with daily, what does it feel like for those who are not supported and left behind in the rapid digital transformation? 
Recently, our national justice team conducted research with those with lived experience of the justice system and their access to employment opportunities. Technology was raised as a key issue. And as the rapid transformation takes place, what does it mean when you're excluded from society for a period of time? In the absence of access to technology and the internet while in prison, for example, any progression in technology leaves people further behind and it makes it harder for them to quickly adapt and navigate society's online interactions. MyGov becomes not an everyday platform, but a new and strange technology. <coughs> and if you return home and no longer have access to your identity documents, like was highlighted in disaster situations, well, where do you even start to be able to gain access to online platforms necessary to interact in society? From the research, people told us that asking for help can make them feel judged, which they can tell just from the facial expressions of staff that seem to say, what planet have you been living on? Embarrassment is a familiar emotion shared amongst these reintegrating into the community. And this is all before they try to navigate the world of online job applications, where ADM will likely be used to screen and process their application. Of course, that is, there is an opportunity here to ensure digital literacy is included as part of re rehabilitation employment programs during or on exit from the justice system. In our aged care programs, we work to reduce loneliness and social exclusion through pro programs like our flag flagship telephony program, Telecross. Our frontline teams tell us that before commencing services, a lot of support is often needed to ensure people have the basics like access to a phone, and one that's working and a phone that they can use. Landlines are still common, but often we see children of, children of older people helpfully transitioning their parents to a mobile, which leads to anecdotes such as, oh, I've got a phone, but I don't know how to use it. Older Australians as a cohort have the lowest levels of digital literacy in the country, yet the design of the still quite recent My Age Care, which is the consumer entry point for services, only included web and phone-based access points. In the recent Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, it was really highlighted that many people have significant challenges in navigating the complex aged care system, including uh, my aged care specifically. I've, interestingly, I think we're about seven years from the initial rollout, we're now seeing some of those in-person functions replaced back into this, or being put back into the service system. Um, seeing face-to-face -face staff, uh, navigator staff in Services Australia, and from next year, a new care finder model focused on outreach and intensive support for the most vulnerable will be rolled out. Of course, there are significant opportunities for ADM in aged care. Facial recognition technologies utilised in pain management, fall detection technology to keep, that keep people safely at home for longer, and robopets for social companionship are just some examples. On the other side, looking at some of those failings that we see in the My Age Care rollout, it's important to ensure that the rollout of ADM tech is designed for quality service outcomes, not a quick fix um, to where we're seeing significant workforce crisis in the sector. I wanted to finish with a couple of very quick stories uh, where we have been recently used some technology in our aged care programming to build digital literacy, inclusion and wellbeing. Our team in New South Wales have been using virtual reality goggles to take residents of aged care facilities on virtual tours of the world, traveling to the edge of volcanoes, the Eiffel Tower, and on safari. Another team in partnership with digital inclusion experts, Yolink, rolled out a pilot, the TechSmart Seniors Program. The program provides participants with an iPad and training on how to use it for both fun and building skills for digital connection. This was piloted in response to, the, to seeing clients with increasing mental health concerns and exacerbation of isolation during COVID-19. Clients who wouldn't leave, couldn't leave home and were without the digital skills needed to maintain any connection to friends, family and their communities. My favourite story from this program was about Ken. Ken had never utilised video calling functionality before, but after teaching him how to use it, he was able to video call his sister in New Zealand. Ken and his sister had stayed in touch while they'd been apart, but they actually hadn't seen each other's faces in about 15 years. They were very happy to finally be able to see each other, but their first reaction was just to laugh at each other for five minutes because they were so amused to see how old they had each gotten. These stories are the kind of experiences we see, I guess, at the, what I feels like the pointy end of the impacts of digital transformation and ADM technologies, but also those opportunities we have to find the balance by ensuring systems are widely accessible for all and, build, and to build digital skills that have wide-ranging benefits for individuals beyond just basic rights, um, their basic right to equi equitably access social services. Thank you.
Okay, we are finally at the time of the morning when we get to come and hear from you. We're going to break you out into small table discussions in a moment where we want to hear your examples of ADM, the impacts on communities, the risks and challenges, and the opportunities of ADM for humanitarian and community work. And you'll have questions on your table. Before you start moving, a bit of housekeeping. Um, each group will try and split our panelists and Humanitech uh, team members amongst. I think we've got about 40 people in the room and if we could have six to seven to come forward and uh, join the tables, that would be fantastic. Um, and you'll have some paper there to document your thoughts and hopefully someone to help you do that too. For those of you joining online, Sanushka and Julia will be there and we welcome you to also uh, continue the discussion while we're at the tables. Quick rules of engagement, join in, they're very simple. Join in, capture your discussions, car park off topic discussions, listen respectfully and find your future collaborators. Great, I'll get you all together at your tables now, thank you. Well, we should have, we're a little bit over but we should have about 10 to 15 minutes if our panellists are very quick to wrap us up at the end. We got thank you. Time. Yes, panellists please head down, I've just got something for you. Okay, I think we're ready to start um, with the online discussion group. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I think you will be able to come off mute and share um, your thoughts as we go through this. Um, but otherwise, if you ha are having any tech issues, uh, you're welcome to put things into the chat and Sanushka and I can transpose them across. Uh, my name's Julia, I'm part of the Humanitech team I'm based in Adelaide, so joining online, very excited to be here with you. Uh, our first discussion question for today is, how are automated technologies presenting in your work or research or experience um, relevant to humanitarian and community programs and services? So um, we've heard a range of great examples from the panellists, and we're really interested in hearing about what you're seeing in your own um, communities and work. Uh, so is anyone happy to come off mute and share a case study or an example with us? But I think alternatively, if you don't have um, your own kind of work examples that you want to share, um, you're also welcome to kind of bring up ones you've heard in the media or been reading about or through your kind of learnings and travels through um, the world of automated decision making. Uh, because we're interested in, in exploring what are the kind of systems impacts that automation could have on society um, and particularly the most vulnerable in our communities. We might just do a little check of if, if any of this tech is working. Um, if you are comfortable, would you come off me and introduce yourself um, and let us know what's kind of brought you here today? And we'll just see if anything is working for those that are online. Uh, thanks, Christian. So Christian's jumped into the chat um, and said they're particularly interested in ADM's possible applications to humanitarian visa decision making. Um, Sanushka, that was one of the examples that you've, you've touched on. Do you have any thoughts you want to add to that? 
think it's a very vexed area. Um, one of the things, as I was thinking about my comments last night, um, or my comments for today, last night, um, I was thinking that in, in many ways, the, the fact that we even are able to police, the fact that national governments think that it is a reasonable and desirable outcome to be able to control who enters every border and what they do while they're inside, if they're not a non-citizen, is a function of the existence of ATM. <laughs> and it's not something that has any historical precedent. A lot of the borders, um, a, a lot of what modern migration policy is trying to control are patterns of movement that have been occurring over centuries um, for various reasons in different communities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a bit of a tangential way of saying, I think I personally am concerned about the possible application of ADM in humanitarian visa decision making. Obviously, there's the potential for ADM to overcome the human biases that are um, inherent to those processes. And potentially, I guess there's a world in which those processes being neutral could um assist in ensuring that humanitarian needs are met. But I, I, I per personally, again, just speaking for myself, I, I, th I think that the ways that we've seen ADM used um, is so replete with examples of uh, human biases being hardwired into decision-making processes. And those, those hardwired biases not be um, uh, transparent, that I, I would really worry that what it may mean is, you know, a blanket uh, dumping of visa applications from people of certain nationalities or uh, young men, you know, within a certain age group or, or based on criteria that we wouldn't even know about but would not be uh, consonant with the types of humanitarian decisions. But Christian, perhaps you could um, explain a bit more about what your interest is in this area and whether, um, yeah, how you would approach this concern. And while um, Christian's responding, um, if anyone else has a particular area of interest, please feel free to share that in the chat as well. Julia, is Humanitech um, exploring? I know we've had conversations at various points about various bits of our work that intersects, but we haven't talked specifically about visas. Is Humanitech, um, uh, have you been involved in any projects looking at this area? Um, not visas specifically, um, but sort of more broadly, we're working um, with Ed Santo on his model law recognition project, and we have a real interest in, um, yeah, digital identification technologies and the different ways in which government policy can provide protections and build trust or erode it. And I think... Um, it's going to become more commonly a, a problem across borders and um, the risk of misuse, if, as you've said, um, you know, really trying to get them to reduce and, and balance out the benefits or um, for us looking at policy advocacy where the risk doesn't, um, the benefits don't outweigh the risks and how we can work here with the Australian government and then um, internationally as well to kind of try and address that. Um, Christian's written, um, if anyone can't access the chat, um, definitely the flip side to the correction of human biases is the application of human discretion to understand humanitarian context. I just can't see how we can teach AI to exercise the reasonable person test inherent to administrative and immigration law. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I guess it's this question of if you've got an, an incredibly flawed system at present, um, 
what happens if you introduce further complexity into that system with AI? Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's a very complicated area. Um, and I, I actually don't know what happened with this, but I know that in 2019, um, as Minister Peter Dutton, I think, finalised a tender and actually selected a company to apply automated decision making to visa processes. And then it was all cancelled. And I'm not actually sure of any of the details of this, but um, what I what I find interesting about the fact that it, what I find interesting about that is that we were so as a country so close to having a company actually be commissioned by the Australian government to design and implement a system of automated decision making. I mean, thank goodness that didn't happen because I think it's all a bit premature. Um, and again, I'd be very curious to know why it didn't all happen. It's just suddenly the tender was cancelled and it was all off. Um, but yeah, th these nuances are. Um, uh, I think we're just not at a stage where these nuances can be built into the systems. Equally, you could argue that um, the way the reasonable person test has been applied by humans in an Australian administrative and immigration law context, and, and I, I guess also the way in which that level of human decision making is constrained by uh, the types of immigration policies that have been pursued by governments over a long period of time. Um, is also deeply problematic. So, uh, yeah, I think there are no easy answers in this um, in this arena. Christian, perhaps could you tell us, is your instinct that it should be left alone or that it should be explored further? Fascinating. Mm. And I think that's uh, this, um, to determine if we should leave it alone, we must explore further. I think we're, we're seeing that across the board and it's um, what level of, of testing and learning is appropriate before we put those risks into motion versus how can we learn without putting vulnerable people kind of in the centre before we realise down the track that we've gone too far and we've exacerbated problems. I think there's an interesting kind of crossover case around this discussion around human biases with um, some work we're doing in the emergency services sector where we're looking at how can we bring um, data around things like flood risk to communities to enable their decision making. And, um, you know, we have this traditional environment where the decisions are made by government agencies and information is provided um, through a real process down to communities and they're told how to respond to it. And there's a real push in community resilience for communities to be given enough information that they can make their own decisions. But then there's that, that interplay between the more you provide um, data and you have to then rely on the decision making within that data and how it's processed by um, the community end user, you increase the risk of, um, for agencies, the unpredictability of people's reactions because there's less determination in how people will react once you decentralise information and decision making. So um, the sort of flip scenario of taking more decision making ability from the government and putting it in the community's hands and that moral dilemma of how do we predict whether that ultimately makes people safer or um, makes getting our resources to the right place harder. Don't know if anyone has um, experience or kind of thoughts on, on that sort of flipped version.
no takers on that one. Um, that's all right. If we shift now to some of the opportunities of automated um, decision making in humanitarian work. Um, does anyone have little snippets of hope where they'd like to see automated decision making um, providing an opportunity to improve services or make life better for marginalised communities? And while people are thinking, Sanushka, I might throw to you for in your work, what is a, um, an area of hope you've seen where there is a spark where it could be used for good? It's a very difficult question to answer, actually. Um, uh, and I, I was I was thinking about this with my colleagues yesterday as well. It, it's not so much that there aren't sparks for hope, because there certainly are. I think I think um, having joined up information about uh, movements of people or being able to predict movements of people as part of disaster um, resilience planning um, has huge potential, but then the risks, the, the risks inherent to that are what immediately makes me nervous because if, for example, um, there were clearer systems to track movements of people up to the border and the coast of Libya um, who are then going to get on boats to move towards Greece and Italy and Spain, um, I would imagine that that information would simultaneously be used to erect barriers and um, prevent people's movement in the way that we're already seeing happening with you know all these um, boat pushbacks. And so I, I every time I think of ways in which humanitarian service delivery could be improved, I immediately think of the dangers of that information. Um, and and I suppose the other thing, and this is a tricky one, um, is that our research into migrants' as trust in humanitarian assistance suggests fairly clearly that people who have made the decision to take those risks would rather um, avoid humanitarian assistance points than take the risk that those assistance points are being run by an agency that might share their data because they've basically, and I know this is a crude way of putting it, but people have already decided that they're going to try and get to where they're going or lose their life in the process. And I think it's that which um, we need to grapple with more perhaps than the provision of um, how we provide services more effectively. Sorry, not not that we should grapple with more, but it's a really, it's a very live thorny question for the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement. What is our role in the context of these kinds of situations where, um, yeah, I, sorry, I'm kind of rambling a bit now, but but it's, it's, it's very vexed. Yeah, thank you, Sanushka, and thank you, everyone. Luke, I've seen your comments put in and we'll put them into Sanushka's final remarks. So they're in the board for her, but I think you summed it up beautifully with visibility as double-edged. And I think that's what we're talking about, the opportunities, um, need to consider the risks and we need to make sure we don't put people at further harm through um, in the name of progress. We're going back live and we're going to hear from the panel and hear what the other groups have come up with. Thank you so much. You could, you could just you could say, say came across the other day, you'll be connected evaluation. Um, if I can't, I need to also be able to read my own handwriting, which is one of my biggest fears. We're just here. doing like literally in 20 seconds, one highlight reel. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That was all too short, but a wonderful opportunity to hear from you all. Um, and there was some incredible conversation happening. I know there was some fascinating PhD <coughs> topics uh, being researched at my table. Um, and that, that will be my quick summary. Uh, we heard about things like third party rental platforms using ADM to screen out applicants fraud detection and issues with false uh, positives and false negatives in aged care. Uh, we had impacts uh, regarding 
uh, query variation in search engines. That was just some of what was happening at my table. Thank you all. Um, so I'm going to ask the panel all to share a highlight back from their table as well. Uh, I'll go back and say more than we were before. So Sarah, if you could share a highlight. I've got so many highlights. Um, our table could probably have talked all day. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, I think what was one of the great things was that our examples came from different sectors, from social services, from recruitment, um, from questions of economic justice um, and sacred spaces. So it's, that was really in itself really important to see those diverse areas come together. Um, in terms of the, the opportunities, we had questions of holding businesses and governments to account, campaigning for different values and protocols, embedding ethics and privacy by design in tech, capturing the utility of data um, for contributing, for people to contribute data to, to do it ethically, um, and questions around economic justice and using ADM for Centrelink, free, Centrelink freedom of information. I think for me, the, what I put in the impacts for future society category was kind of also seen so important, this idea of you know, a movement kind of rather than an academic study, um, a campaign, um, the idea of using foresight to move forward. And I think generating new modes of creating foresights and engaging and using foresight is just so important for us as academics as well as, as outside academia. And, and also questions again of supporting sacred space as a way of thinking about um, impacts of future society. So that was more than one thing, but there was so much more so that stood much. out that I haven't said. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, Anthony. Yep, just quickly, some great projects. Um, one on missing disinformation in Indigenous communities in Central Australia, um, which is a Humanitech um, partnership project, um, and uh, work that's looking at ADM tools in, in social services across uh, Asia-Pacific Asia and in Australia, and what's really interesting. Oh, and another project that's Fantastic looking at slow, deliberative, um, small-scale platforms that actually address the needs of, of users in a way that um, isn't looking to scale um, or recognises the issues and, and um, challenges in scale um, and scaling that, that um, often lead to a lot of the risks and challenges that we identified. Um, but just, just quickly... Um, you know, the, the flipping the, the technological switch on ADM, on the tendency to build infrastructure around data collection and ADM for the social services, for example, um, that, can, that sh can, should move from surveillance and punishment and exclusion to inclusion, care and support. And it's really bizarre that we don't see that um, as much as we should. That's my highlight. Thanks, Anthony. Rahul. Um, yeah, I, I think the, 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 the general theme w was really how there's this real uh, chasm or dichotomy between our, our uh, online lives and our offline lives and, and how may these online systems, you know, e even simple things like claiming social security are really set up for people with some kind of digital savviness. And then when it really comes to doing that offline, it takes, uh, I think, a lot more angst for certain communities. And I think what, what's needed is better interoperability among systems. You know, like one of the points we brought up is like MyGov, for example, when it works, it really works. But when it doesn't, it could be a real uh, headache um, and a problem. And, and, and also one of the things w was there has to be better trust between institutions. Uh, so just working on those uh, institutional inter intra-institutional dynamics. Yeah. Fabulous, thank you. Do we, can we just check the Zoom and see if Sanushka's ready to go? Looks like she is. Can you share any highlights that you had in the Zoom group? Sure, uh, we talked about uh, automated decision-making and visa processing and heard about research into cred uh, credibility assessment in protection visa decisions. So the discretionary uh, parts of those processes and, and the ways in which they're subject to human flaws and in many ways inherently unable to be digitised at the same time as um, discussing the, the nuances there and the fact that we really do need more information. We need to understand these systems better before thinking about how they might be applied. We also talked about the value of transparency provided by technology in to the provision of services, but with the flip side, of course, of that 
transparency being used to potentially put vulnerable people at risk of exposure. So we also <clears throat> landed back at the question of trust. Um, trust in those collecting the data, how the how data is used, how personal information is used. And um, I guess my, my take home from the conversation we had was around uh, whether and how it's possible to collect data for humanitarian ends without it being used for the purposes of control and exclusion. And I hope to be able to share with you all uh, next year at this conference, um, the findings of the research that we're conducting in 15 different countries. And uh, if there are any, I'm just going to put in a little plug here, if there are any data analysts out there, we uh, we need some quantitative skills uh, to help us processing the unexpectedly large amount of data we've received um, from an overwhelming response to talking with communities about this question of trust and um receiving feedback from communities on their experiences of humanitarian um, assistance and protection in dangerous migration routes. So we'd love to hear from anybody out there who has experience with quantitative um, data analysis and uh, might be able to support us in the next couple of months. Thank you. And uh, you'd be welcome to reach out, reach out to our Humanitech team members if you need Sanushka's details as well. Great, Mark. We're a little bit about, we've just gone over, so a quick one from you. Um, so I, I think I was at the critical table. We spent a lot of time thinking about um, what it means uh, to automate processes that rely on the collection of data and the concerns that arise around function creep uh, and the potential impact that has on people's willingness to participate in data-driven processes. Uh, and so that led us to questions of accountability. What are the techniques that can be used to um, limit function creep uh, and make the terms of consent clear? We also spent some time thinking about um, ways in which the technology itself can be used to provide increasing forms of accountability, so automated systems uh, that can be used for forms of auditing and tracking. Um, and. Uh, we also spend a little bit of time talking about the use of data for um, forecasting, so thinking about how to more effectively anticipate where resources will be needed in order to uh, expedite them uh, in time. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, panel. You've just been absolutely fantastic today. Thank you for sharing your insights and joining in the discussions. And thank you, especially to our audience, whether you're online or in the room today, for your active participation and generosity in sharing your work and ideas. Our Humanitech team will now be busy collating the insights from today's workshop. So we didn't give you a lot of time for conversation, but please continue it. Um, you can do that by sharing details with your fellow participants um, and by joining our Humanitech community on Slack. Uh, the details are up on the screen there. Slack is a space where Humanitech shares information about events, research, funding, or collaboration opportunities, and where we'll share the outputs from today's session. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you so much for joining the final day uh, of the symposium today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of these sessions. Thank you.